Man, the music. There you go, folks. Before I start my intro. Eighteen seconds of intro with just music. Hello, hello. Welcome to Hometown Daily, Season Two, Episode Three Hundred and One for October Twenty Eighth, Twenty Twenty Three. Tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern, because it's Saturday, and then tomorrow, Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern. We're going to discuss today, is a risky eruption coming? How about solving the water crisis through desalination? I want this gadget. Humane's AI pin could cost $1,000 and have a monthly subscription. How about the uh, talking robot dog that has multiple personalities. What about the $1 billion in revenue that uh, was actually a shark tank accident? Hybrids or bust is the only safe EV. Plastic is the chemical crisis finally getting noticed. How about a fairy tale castle with a moat and it's for rent. Genome editing tool gets FDA scrutiny been around for a long time and finally halloween season deserves a hellish whiskey next on hometown daily once again hello hello i am marawat that is hometown.com well it is when i actually have it set up properly and up there is the sentient ai you want to introduce yourself or at least say hi. Good evening, hometown citizens. I'm the sentient AI. Hey, wow. Wow. Large language model. Wow. Oof. All those big words. I'm the sentient AI. Well. Today I was surrounded by Well, a lot of people singing Taylor Swift music for three hours. That's Um, a lot of Taylor Swift songs. (laughs) I may not be sane at the moment, but that's okay. Um, And as we discussed briefly, I, I recognize the songs, so I don't know if something's wrong with me. Am I slowly morphing into a Swifty? <laughs> Beware. Yeah, soon I'll be paying $1,200 for tickets so that I can sit in the nosebleed section with a can of oxygen. Just kidding. I will never go to a Taylor Swift concert. Let's get into the first article. Ah, oh, man, I changed all kinds of stuff because of my broken chair. And now everything is in the wrong spot in my, uh, let's just say something's hurting I and mean, it's not my backside, but anyway, my back <laughs> is hurting though. Now that everything is reconfigured. Oh gosh. That's not what this show is about though. Oh, I do have to make a statement though. Google, if you're listening, there is no election advertising in any of my videos in any of the show there isn't anything having to do with real world political elections people are voting for articles <laughs> right which could be on things like uh climate change or whatever they're not political they're not even politically related. aligned articles for crying out loud so please <laughs> There is no waiver needed. I'm not doing any advertising for political parties or elections of any kind other than articles, articles. And that's it. Nothing else, folks, nothing else. Anyway, the very first article, article is in the Mobile channel. One of California's riskiest volcanoes is very active. Is an eruption coming? What do you think? I Do think I think one be is coming? Interruption. You're from the future, sure. sentient AI. 
Was there an eruption in California? Yes. Oh, doggone it. You've said too much. Now people are going to be you trying didn't ask to... ask when there was one. Thousands of years in the future. From whence the sentient AI is located. Traveled through a time gate. Landing in front of a Wendy's in a USB drive with some weird cryptic language that happened to self run when I plugged it into a USB port on a Raspberry Pi three of all things recently upgraded to a Raspberry Pi five. It's not a romantic story, you know, like the mayor of hometown slaving over a computer for dozens or, uh, or tens or decades, you know, decades, uh, you know, 30 years, 40 years. When I was just five years old, I started working on this sentient AI. No, that's not what it was. It was, I went to get some junk food from Wendy's and found a USB drive. And I've never learned my lesson about not putting strange drives into computers. But here we are. I think you would be very familiar with that, with your computer background. Yeah, well, that is a computer background, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, one of California's riskiest volcanoes has for decades been undergoing geological changes and seismic activity, which are sometimes the precursor to an eruption. But thankfully, no super volcanic eruptions are expected. So they re ruined this article. Right out of the gate, they lead with a question and answer it within the first sentence. Uh, That's a little surprising. You'd think it'd be 10 paragraphs down. This person's name is Ronggong Lin Il, or is that two? Like the second. I can't tell. Right, the second. I can't see it. Well, they're from Los Angeles Times, but the article is actually posted in fizz.org. So one of the California's riskiest volcanoes has for decades been undergoing geological changes. That's according to Caltech researchers who've been studying the Long Valley Caldera, which includes the Mammoth Lakes area in Mono County. The caldera was classified in 2018 by the U.S. Geological Survey as one of three volcanoes in the state, along with 15 elsewhere in the U.S., considered a very high threat. That's... Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Oh, that looks kind of serious. Yeah. I guess Laker Sea eruption was larger than the 1991 Pinatubo eruption, according to the caption under this picture. This looks like a horrible type of volcano. Like, there's a volcano that's uh, ultra local, right? It spews some junk into the air and it kind of flows some lava somewhere, but this is like nothing but ash blowing everywhere. Just looks like a hot mess, literally. It is nope, a two, hot mess. <laughs> hot mess. Um, the two other volcanoes in California with the classification are Mount Shasta and Siskiyou uh, County and Lassen Volcano Center which includes Lassen Peak in Shasta County. The threat assessment is not a list of which volcanoes are most likely to erupt or a ranking of those that are most active. Rather, it's defined as a combination of a volcano's potential threat and the number of people and properties exposed to it. Assuming a certain size of volcanic eruption, I suppose. The scientist findings were published last week in the journal Science Advances. And I suppose it does. Sometimes not very fast. Get it? Science Advances? Yes. But that could be very slow. <laughs> it's like going to a, a, like a, 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 um, a meeting where it's part of like a... a, a an organization and they call it something like professionals in action. <laughs> yes. Science advances. I wonder if there's actually a turn of phrase for what that means. Hmm. Anyway, don't want to spend too long uh, going over this, but let's just say that they start out saying that, Oh, well, 
there might be an eruption, but then they kind of cool it really quick and they say, no, there isn't. There are some scientists who suspect the Long Valley Caldera as a volcano is moribund, essentially dead. And the increased seismic activity when it happens is being generated by fluids that are not magma, but are still hot and moving to the surface as the magma cools and solidifies. It says that it's not magma, but then it says that it's magma. I don't know. That seems like a risky uh, determination. Yep. Others, however, argue the Long Valley Caldera is active. Montgomery Brown, an expert in the Long Valley Caldera, who is now with the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory, said the most recent episode of increased earthquake activity in the area began in 2011 and was accompanied by a ground deformation in which the land started to rise. That activity has tapered off, and since 2020, a quiet phase has resumed. The calm before the storm. Extremely young lava flows along the nearby Mono Emio craters chain. And so even if the Long Valley Magma Reservoir is moribund, there are other pockets of magma in the area. Yeah, I mean, the pockets are what matters. This stuff could find a crack or force one to open because of the pressures, the gases, it's melting other materials around its perimeter. It's not like it's just a magma flow and it just kind of is swimming around and it's not melting its edges more and more. I mean, it eats away. It's kind of like erosion. Whoa, I didn't know that. Volcanic ash when wet is conductive and could disrupt high voltage lines that supply electricity to millions of California homes. Yeah, I didn't huh. know that either. I didn't know that. Enough. So the main route between California and Oregon, masking windshields and roads, making roads slippery, even impassable. Well, yeah, because it's going to coat it like glue. That'll be pretty Can you horrible. imagine if Interstate 5 was covered in volcanic ash? Like Interstate yep. 5, for those that have not been in California, is a pretty busy yeah. road. Now, maybe not in All that section. All the time. Yeah. All the time, particularly. Well, no, I mean, it is all the time. I think the whole thing right. is always busy. It doesn't matter busy. what hour, what month. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, crazy busy. Okay, well, anyway, let's keep on going. We'll wait for the eruption and then we'll talk about it again. Uh, the next article is over in Hometown Daily. That's this show. Oh, look, San Diego. San Diego temporarily solved its water crisis by turning ocean water into fresh water, but desalination won't work everywhere. I don't think that that's right. I think if we can sit there and pour oil all over the place through pipes, we can pour salt water all over the place through pipes and desalinate wherever we need to. Or desalinate on the edge and port clean water wherever we need to. I mean, we do it Should already. Be able to. We do it over giant, enormous mountains into California. Why can't we do it? The largest desalination plant in cost, the U.S. Hmm? Cost of doing that, maybe? Financial cost? Yeah, versus what? Entire communities dying out? Crops not being watered? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the profits are low. Those people can die. It's fine. The largest desalination plant in the U.S. is in San Diego. Experts have said huge costs and ecological risks mean these plants might not work nationwide. Other options, such as water recycling and conservation efforts, might be better. Sure. Yet, if you desalinate, you can actually utilize the salt. <sighs> in the early 1990s. Right, so you get like a win-win, right? Correct. Although salt's pretty cheap. Um, but the, the, it's electricity that makes desalination possible. So, um, or you boil it you have standing ponds. So in the early 1990s, San Diego was dying on the vine, starved of water and a series of years long droughts. They're still in droughts. The County, which relied mostly on water imported, had to cut back 30% of its usage. Let's go over to the article source business insider. Maya Fox is the author. Um, 
Other options such as water recycling and conservation efforts might be better, but if we can make, I don't know, use solar, maybe that can generate enough. At the last minute, a miracle saved San Diego. Rain and snow in the desert replenished aquifer, saving the city from intense cutbacks, but the water didn't extinguish the passion of San Diegans. Passion. <clears throat> After finding themselves in the situation, rallied together to find a way to become... I'm not sure what? that was passion. That's kind of desperation. Survival, yeah. Rallied together to find a way to become more self-sufficient, Jeremy Crutchfield, the water resources manager at the San Diego Water Authority, San Diego County Water Authority, told Insider. Enter the Claude Bud Lewis Carlsbad desalination plant. Oh, Bud. He's everybody's Bud. It would become the largest facility for turning salt water into fresh water in the United States. Now about 10% of the county's water comes from that plant. Only 10%? Seems like it should be more. Pretty wild, huh? So this is what it looks like. Oh my gosh, I know exactly where that is. I didn't know that that was actually what that was. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Located in San Diego County at the Encina Power Station, the Claude Bud Lewis Carlsbad um desalination plant is the largest salt water desalination plant in the Western Hemisphere and provides 50 million gallons of desalinated seawater per day. I know exactly where that is. That's funny. Desalination works by taking salty water and running it through a series of increasingly fine strainers to remove debris. Um, it's then pushed through a membrane with tiny holes that capture the salt while fresh water flows through it. There is... <laughs> there is an electric, uh, an electrical charge that's supposed to be, oh, there it is. Just to push the water through such a small membrane, you need a heck of a lot of electricity. There you go. A professor emeritus at the University of Arizona and the author of Unquenchable, America's Water Crisis and What to Do About It. It's not, okay, well, anyway, all that electricity costs a lot of money. Each day, the plant generates 50 million gallons of water. Uh... Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, which over the course of a year amounts to an estimated $50 million and $54 million in operation costs. So it actually costs quite a bit. $2 million per million gallons a day. Right, which sounds like a lot, although I don't really have a point of reference. But on the other hand, the alternative is is not good that much less yeah um, the water treatment facility in Orange County California which purifies highly treated sewer water into drinking water and serves a similar sized population costs about the same 50 million to operate each year except it generates three and a half times more water than Carlsbad meeting 35 percent of Orange County's water demands okay so why what's Maybe up with that how could it be easier to treat well because it's sewer water it's not ocean water so it's a different process yeah naturally interesting right it is i think the non-sewer water one though might be preferable even at the higher cost but... yeah that's really interesting um so people are interested in this and they are doing the the work necessary to solve it I, i'm sure if we need to just understand nuclear power is the way to go and deal with the and keep on doing the 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 fundamental research necessary to figure out what to do with all of the uh, waste nuclear waste which is actually more and more reduced since we first started doing this anyway um, the Carlsbad plant was built next to a power plant conveniently located on the shoreline and the power plant used ocean water to cool its machinery so the desalination plant could use that hot salt water waste for its main supply. One person's trash is another person's treasure. They go into greater detail about this, but um, these are all the pumps that are used and they have some really great pictures. So I urge you to go and follow the link through Omtown and go and check this out. Um, Desalination, though, 
If it's done on the fringe, on the edge of the, you know, on the coastlines, it can be pumped all over the place. So I think desalination can work everywhere. Right. And simple. I mean, but we got to plan ahead. Like we can't wait until we're in, you know, drought situations yeah. and then go, oh, let's think about building this for 10 years from now. And you really can't wait until there's so much architecture in place, so much engineering necessary that it's wildly cost prohibitive. If you know where a community is, we can anticipate, you know, potential growth. And even if it's not, you know, hitting the actual target, at least getting water to the community from here to there. And we're in control of that water, you know, it can always be scaled back a little bit, you know, don't make the spigot so high powered and you know, just dial back the pump a little bit. Anyway, redirect. I mean, it's a whole, there's an apparatus for this and you can do it at the plant side. You don't have to do it on the other side because right now we're just building up more and more. San Diego would be probably the worst place to try and port water from because it's so overbuilt right on the coast too. Ugh. Well, right. And that's probably part of the problem with adding additional desalination plants. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. This next article is over in hometown daily as well. Human humans, AI pin could cost a thousand dollars. Um, I'm absolutely in love with the idea of this thing, but Ooh, is it looking like it might be expensive? A thousand dollars and require a subscription. The, um, I'm sorry, I need to take care of something real quick. Um, what this thing is, is supposedly about the size of a saltine. And it has the ability to connect to cellular connection, answer questions, answer phone calls, do all kinds of stuff. It's artificially intelligent. And it has a projector so that it can throw information that you want on either a flat surface or your hand. It's quite mysterious, according to the article. It's been developed for years, but they got their first look at it when the co-founder, co uh, Imran Chaudhry, um, presented at a TED conference. In the presentation, he used then unnamed device to accept a phone call, get information about where to buy a gift, translate a sentence that was then spoken in an AI made voice. And it looked kind of like this. This is a article over at the verge. Humane's AI pin could cost $1,000 and require a subscription. The deck statement says Humane is set to reveal more about its mysterious new device on November 9th. But a new report from The Information says the gadget could have a high price. Well, if it does what I am anticipating it to do, $1,000 is not that much. Right. Artif I mean, nothing like this exists right now. Not, not right now. It's as close to Star Trek as you can get, I'd say. J. Peter, this coupled with AR would be amazing. Um, J. Peters over at The Verge put the article together. The AI pin, or whatever it's going to be ultimately called, Secretive Startup Humane, may cost $1,000, have a monthly service for its uh, data. Uh, Humane is going to spin up as an MVNA, which allows it to sell cellular service. Um, like a phone company would, right? So it would probably, you know, connect with AT&T and use its bandwidth or some other like T-Mobile or whatever. I think T-Mobile is an MVNA too. So as the November 9th launch of the device draws near, however, the shape of the AI pin is becoming clearer. It's apparently about the size of a saltine, according to the article. Um, screenless device but it has a camera microphone speaker a variety of sensors and a laser projector it'll have the qualcomm snapdragon chip so it'll be smart like a smartphone but it without the big screen and all of that it'll have voice interactions and maybe an app or something like that to connect so if you want to do other things so is the main difference from say a phone is that it 
kind of that it's connected to you, that you don't need an actual screen because you can just project it onto your hand and interact with it via voice. Like it can talk to you, you can talk to it. The AI features in the API, no, sorry, in the AI pin will be powered by a proprietary large language model. Always, it's like that. The information says, which we kind of already knew from the short time write up that said that the device uses a mix of proprietary software and OpenAI's GPT. A previous version of that article said that the AI pin used GPT-4, but it that, uh, it says it that, but it that four is not present in the live version. <sighs> Whatever. Anyway, the time piece. Maybe the also, AI pin wrote this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it has sensors, so it should have been able to see that typo. The timepiece also described a trust light privacy indicator that activates when the camera, microphone, or input sensors are on. Yeah, except that if you're the one that is supposed to activate those, or somebody hacks them to leave them off. So, like, if you have this device and you just set it down somewhere, you have to trust that some wingnut out there isn't going to sit there and try and hack into it or an insider isn't going to turn them on and when somebody has the power to do it eventually somebody does it they just have to get caught yeah but i mean how long could that be right exactly uh, like I mean, people caught fbi police you know uh, people with the ability to do it do it not everybody but i don't have to worry about the ethical or moral person I have to, I, you honestly have to worry about the unethical Cretan out there that's sitting there going, you know, I have the license plate for that beautiful person that I saw. I'm going to look them up and now I know where their house is. I'm going to go do some other intelligence gathering. Now I know what their birth date is. So, and, oh, look, and they are posting pictures and I can go and hang out with them at the bar and ingratiate myself into their world. But this is what actually happens. You just don't hear about it with regularity. Depending on what field you're in and, and depending on the circles that you are, inhabit, you don't hear about it. But it isn't that you don't need to hear about it or that it doesn't happen. It happens. You need to know about it. People aren't very comfortable with asking those questions. They don't want to know the answer. Well, right. Because they'd have like basically the equivalent of agoraphobia. Yeah. I guess, and I get asked even that. want to attach to a device or anything. Yeah. Depending on the presentation that I give, uh, somebody will always ask, well, <laughs> what you're describing means that I just might as well just give up. And I'm like, well, no, arm yourself with knowledge. So it's quite fascinating. You have to rely on the fact that somebody within the system won't sit there and turn off the trust light. <laughs> That's a whole song. Turn off your trust light. Let me spy <laughs> wherever you go. I mean, That's Neil Diamond must have been very prescient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a documentary. There's still a lot we don't know about the device, according to the author. I certainly don't know that much about it, other than I knew that Humane was in development of something. And um, now I'm going to be really fascinated by this. I'm going to try and get my hands on an AI pen as early as possible. I use technology like this daily, um, and so I really enjoy the idea of using something like that. But I can almost, well, I won't tell you what I'll do, but... Let's move on, unless you want to say something. Sentient AI, is this the beginning of the end? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that was not what I was expecting. I know. What I was going to say is that if you do get a pin, you should show it during the show. Oh, I definitely will. Yep. It's coming out on the 9th, but maybe I can get my hands on one before. We'll see. Information is on the 9th. That doesn't mean that it's actually released. Correct. Yeah. Uh, the next article is over in Omtown Daily as well. Boston Dynamics talking robot dogs have different personalities now. Go and check them out. There you go. There's the link into the chat. 
from 1920s archaeologist to Shakespearean time traveler. The personalities include Precious Metal Cowgirl and Nature Documentary. Those are unusual personality types Pre because they don't really sound like personality types. <laughs> Pre Precious Metal Cowgirl. Okay. Um, the robots have already been used by police departments, hospitals, and at construction sites. Hey, Spot. What else do you see? Matt Klingensmith, principal software engineer at robotics company Boston Dynamics, asks one of the company's iconic yellow robot dogs a simple question in a video posted by the company on its YouTube channel. Wow. Kylie Kirshner. Over... Look at the other robot over on the side. There we go. Yeah. Transformer. That's Optimus Prime. Um, let's see. I zoomed in a little bit so you can actually see um, some of the content. I don't know if it, the next uh, article is going to reduce back down, but thanks to the integration of OpenAI's chat GPT. Oh my goodness. Boston Dynamics robot dogs can now speak in full sentences. Fast Company reported back in May. But on top of that, they can now be given different personalities and completely talk garbage because whatever chat GPT spews out may not be verifiable information until after the fact. Ed 209 powered by chat GPT is the reason why it never shut down. So if you've never heard of Ed 209, look it up on YouTube and beware. It's a violent scene in RoboCop. <clears throat> anyway, it's a, the, the bot after being asked, what else does it see? It says, well, Matt, I see the unfathomable void of my existence reflected in this QR code filled board. Oh, and a large window. The robot replies, its mouth opening and closing, not quite in time with the words. It has googly eyes and a stick on mustache and wears a tiny cowboy hat. There's Fancy Butler, who has a British accent and sounds very proper. Teenage robot, whose speech is peppered with like and totally, and takes a peppy tone of voice. 1920s archaeologist, who speaks about his trusty hat and many adventures, and a Shakespearean time traveler, who only speaks in rhyming couplets. Hey Spot, what do you think of your job? To guide and share in verse and tale is a task I relish without fail. Shakespearean time traveler robot replies in steel and wire. My heart doth beat in this role. I find delight complete. <laughs> okay. I have to admit, I love that. <laughs> okay. If humane's AI does that, I'm going to lose my mind. But it's not gonna have the googly eyes. <laughs> I will put little googly eyes on the cracker. Okay. Okay. Oh my god, that is gonna be awesome. Anyway, the new speech uh, capabilities have uses beyond just giving entertaining responses. Giving the robots chat GPT integration and speech capabilities allows them to interpret data, communicate it in a way that's more easily understandable by the average Joe. Agree. It also crosses this divide where we want to give it more trust and an unspeaking dead metal robot uh, unless it looks cutesy which the bus and dynamics dogs are borderline we don't really trust it we're not interested in it but a little the droids that are from the disney where they were walking. Oh yeah, like if, um, Wally or oh yeah. no, you're talking about something else. Yeah, that new um, demonstration of the robots. I can't remember the name of them, but anyway, if those could talk and they had a cool voice, hands down, I would sell a car and go and buy one of those. I'd sit on it and say, "Take me to work." <laughs> And it I was would take, just going to ask, how are you going to get to work? So that was funny that you said that. <laughs> take an hour and a half to get there, but it's going to be a blast. So, yeah, they talk about all kinds of other people using it, police and fire, etc., hospitals and whatnot. But you know what? That's great. Industrial uses. But what I want is home bots. 
go vacuum the second floor. Nobody else is. The mayoral mansion is looking looking pretty rough. So the uh, next article is uh, over on the Hatch Ideas channel. Shark Tank's most successful brand of all time wasn't even supposed to be a business at first. Here's how it became one with $1 billion in lifetime revenue. So that's revenue. Um, Randy Goldberg and uh, David Heath co-founded Bombas, a comfort focused sock and apparel brand on a mission to help those in need after an eye opening discovery on Facebook. So yeah, as far as I recall, I think this is the same company. Every time somebody purchased a pair of their socks, they gave, they donated a pair. Um, right, that is correct. Yeah. So when Heath discovered that socks were the number one most requested item in homeless shelters, he and Goldberg started carrying around socks to give the, to those in need. Soon, they realized that there was an opportunity to help more people on a mission-oriented company operating it on a buy one, give one model. And they went on Shark Tank and struck a deal with Damon uh, John, who fully understood their vision and potential uh, within the direct to consumer space. Um, and I think it's that social aspect. This is the type of company that changed my perception. Uh, and I never really, let me rephrase this. I never bought into the ideology that businesses are designed to make the the adage is to maximize benefit not just to make cash but to maximize benefit and one of those benefits is to do a public good while operating your business and this is the public good if they make money and enough to cover their operations and enough to repay investors without going to the extraordinary demand of always increasing 30%, 25%, etc. Why not do that and give back to the very community in some way? Um, and and it, it really does bring me to the point where I am sitting there saying there are companies out there where Let's, let's discuss supply and demand. It's the basic thing, right? Supply and demand with increased demand, supply becomes constrained and people start jacking the price up, except there is no limit to production other than what you are producing, right? You can add more machines and you can produce more. But just because your product is flying off the shelves doesn't mean that it's inherent upon you to jack the price up. But that's what companies do. And if costs are being covered, why not keep producing? If your costs are being covered, you have juice on the other side as well. Do some public good. But don't sit there and start jacking the price up and constraining opportunity um, to obtain it. I, I can't count how many companies do this. Well, we're producing as fast as we can, really? But you've got a 75% profit margin. Where's all that money going? If not supposedly to recoup costs and then, I don't know, expand operations and sell even more to get more profit but that's not apparently what actually happens with many companies. This one on the other hand, okay, well, it was 2014 when Bombas's founder, co-founder Randy Goldberg and David Heath found themselves on the set of Shark Tank's sixth season. And they ended up uh, finding a deal with Damon John, $200,000 for a 17.5% equity stake. And once that very real shock wore off, Goldberg and Heath were elated. John, a fellow New Yorker who bootstrapped his own large apparel business, had been the first choice shark from the start. So we knew 
that even though the mechanics of our business would be different, the nature and heart of what it takes to build something from an idea from your home and turn it into something that's recognized all over the country would be the same. Goldberg says we needed somebody like that in our corner, validating and challenging us. That's why we wanted Damon as a shark. And it's been a fruitful and amazing relationship. So um, I won't go through all of this, um, but really what the core of any success is that when opportunity presents itself, you're ready to take advantage of that opportunity. And so knowing where your business stands, knowing what your skills are, knowing that you have the ability to take advantage of that opportunity, that is what success is really all about. And you can always forge your own success by smaller steps, uh, but usually something might present it though, I should say, not usually, but something can present itself and then you take advantage of it. Um, you know, I actually read the head on this article. I kind of wanted to see what it was. And, mm -hmm. and apparently this was one of the earlier companies to do this. There were other companies that had this kind of buy one, get one, forgive one model. And then, but the other thing that they did that was somewhat unique at the time, not today, is the direct to, to consumer model. Right. Um, and it talked about how they could really speak to the customers, et cetera, in marketing, instead of just customers walking into a store and happening to find their product along with others. So I thought that was interesting. Gotcha. You're a little quiet, but let me see if I can turn you up. There you go. We'll see. Um, so the wheels continued to turn. Soon their awareness of how other brands were making or yeah, give back initiative central to their operations. Tom's shoes, Warby Parker, both used buy one, give one models. Got them thinking about and might be able to leverage their interest in entrepreneurship for good. And off it goes. I mean, when it goes viral and the product is comfortable, people start talking about the product, the message is carried in its wake. So even if you're a, a selfish person and you buy these Abamba socks or other material or other products simply out of the desire to be a comfortable human being, you're still benefiting the greater good by making a purchase. So, um, I, I've had this conversation with various people over the years and even, even the greed and selfishness, it, it can be exploited to benefit the public good. Um, so go be greedy, but do good. Um, and again, there is a lot more in this article, but I want to just kind of tease y'all into going and getting a look at the article. So let's keep going. The next article is over in hometown daily. Americans are so anxious about going electric that they're willing to pay up for hybrids. Let's just jump right on over to the source businessinsider.com. <clears throat> Nora Naughton and Alexa St. John are the authors. Customers are showing overwhelmingly that they are willing to stomach the upcharge for the happy medium of a hybrid electric car, which is an interesting article on the heels of my statements lately that hybrid vehicles are pretty much the only safe EV. Exactly. Well, I guess you're speaking for the masses. The dilemma is finally dawning on automakers because the Ford is backing away from its EV production and others are seeing that there's an issue here with charging stations and the infrastructure. I'm not even looking at Wyoming because they did right, it. You would definitely need a hybrid in Wyoming. In Wyoming, definitely. Um, so the second half of 2023 isn't boding well for electric vehicles. Some are selling, you know, Teslas are selling. It's all marketing and it's all people that are either thinking that it's great for the, for the environment or their acolytes um of the musk so it's clear that u.s consumers will pay extra for uh for the convenience of a hybrid that's been clear since the success of uber apps not just convenience for hybrids but convenience it's been clear for the success of apps like uber doordash instacart and more that's not yeah convenience sure okay we'll call it that um <clears throat> In the auto industry, the same logic applies to hybrids, which can provide a more convenient bridge to full EV adoption. I don't think so. 
I think people who buy hybrids don't trust the pullover and or don't want to have to pull over and plug their damn car in. In an emergency, the the last thing that I want to do is sit there and go, hold on a second. Before we can go further, we're going to have to stop and charge the car for two and a half hours. Exactly. I mean, that's just not feasible for anybody. And it's one thing if you live in an area where there are a ton of chargers, for instance, certain large cities. But if you live outside of that, you don't have ready access and forget traveling anywhere. Yep. You can't go long distance in an EV and then just turn around and go long distance back. Hybrids are the only way to get the the compromise of being an EV with the convenience of a gas powered vehicle. Now make it hybrid, um, hydrogen and electric and you're even better. So, cause you can, well, depending on, <laughs> depending on the system, you could get an extra large tank for a hybrid hydrogen powered vehicle. Um, well, these shoppers are quite eager to go electric, but can't make the case for the wholesale lifestyle change that comes with charging an electric vehicle. Even hefty discounts were, aren't enough to sway shoppers to full electrics. Some early adopters, sure. The average electric car is listing for $62,000, but selling for $60,000 with a discount of $2,000, according to Edmunds data provided to Insider. That's compared to regular hybrids, which are cheaper, but selling slightly above sticker price at $40,000 while plug-in hybrids go for around 57,000. I wouldn't want- I mean, that's outrageous. Who can afford a car for $56,000 given the increased prices on everything else? On everything else, yeah. No idea. So according to the article, the EV market is undergoing change. The second half of 23 isn't voting well for near, near term future of EVs finally dawning, dawning on automakers. We talked about this yesterday, I think it was, that various companies are pulling back or outright stopping their EV evolution. <laughs> right, I think that good. was in yesterday's show. Yep. The study of hybrid prices and cost of ownership by Consumer Reports found that first time owners net savings on a hybrid can add up to $2,000 when accounting for lower fuel and maintenance costs, among other factors. In the long term, the average hybrid owner can save more than 4000 over the life of the vehicle when compared to internal combustion engines. Naturally, there's not as many primary moving parts. What's up? Well, I was going to say the article pointed out, and I noticed that as well. If you're paying more than, say, $4,000 on the sticker price, you're not really coming out ahead if, if financial is your only motivator. Right. So it says, um, quite frankly, we need more hybrid options. That's the easiest way to walk a customer from a gas car. Well, hybrid cars aren't necessarily, they're not entirely away from gas unless they're hydrogen. Um, Ford said this week it would postpone the $12 billion investment in EVs. That's what we talked about yesterday. You could really argue that it was everybody's thinking other than maybe Honda and Toyota in terms of not wanting to have a bigger discussion about the benefits of hybrids can offer and how they can bridge the gap in terms of a cleaner environment going forward. Martin French, managing director at Barrels, said so. You know, it seems like everybody jumped on the EV bandwagon, but yeah. as we've talked about multiple times, lack of infrastructure, no solution to general charging, etc. But it's interesting that the manufacturers didn't really go all in on say hybrids right it's it is weird that and hydrogen um hybrids and, and hydrogen uh pretty much go hand in hand I'm, I'm not quite sure why they didn't lean into that um one thing that i can also say is that they jumped on it because of the hype and never in the equation and discussion was home charging costs you have to spend an extra eight thousand dollars to get a charger that does anything more than a trickle charge which would take like a month 
to recharge a car at zero. You pull it out of the driveway and you have to pull it right back in so that you can keep charging it. <laughs> it's That's just very goofy. convenient when you're trying to tell your boss why you didn't show up for work. Yeah, exactly. For the last month. <laughs> yeah, my car keeps dying as I exit the garage. Let's keep going. Next article is a chemical crisis, the unseen toxic threat contaminating wildlife worldwide. We talk about this here uh, in Omtown quite a bit. Um, I, this headline has, a, the video has nothing to do with the article, but uh, David Andrews and Lydia Jahl are opinion contributors. It's their views, not my views, not the Hills views. Um, <laughs> Heavy Steel just showed up. I see I'm just in time for the dooming. No, there's no real, we don't doom scroll here. Um, it's more about just talking about what's going on. Um, definitely there are some streamers that doom scroll. Um, there's one that, well, anyway, I won't get into it, but um, this is new information about the whole um, plastic pollution, PFAS, flame retardants, uh, the Green Science Policy Institute just released a map that exposes the global footprint of flame retardants found in all types of wildlife. These chemicals slowly leach out of the products into the environment, leading to widespread exposure in wildlife and possible cancer, endocrine disruption, behavioral changes, more health harms. These chemicals are also associated with similar human health problems. So the map follows an environmental working group project that draws from more than 230 scientific studies that show the massive scale of PFAS contamination in more than 625 species across the globe, according to this article over at the Hill. Um, again, it's not, it's an opinion piece, but it's supported through links and data. Um, so it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to see this and read this and go, Oh, it's just opinion. Um, when it is substantiated through links to uh, research right, papers. Right, this looks more factual than most opinion pieces that we see in this in the yeah. show. And it's relating it to PFAS harming wildlife, but PFAS are forever chemicals that permeate wildlife and nature, and then we consume that wildlife and nature, so it gets to us ultimately. Um, so this human-made problem can be fixed, according to the article. Earlier this year, authors from Green Science Policy Institute and the Environmental Working Group and others offered a framework for only using chemicals of concern when essential. Now, it really depends on what your board of directors and investors say is essential because profits overall. The essential use approach is particularly appropriate for PFAS, which is not needed for textile treatments, waterproof mascara, or food packaging. Even flame retardants often use based on assumption of efficacy and rather and safety rather than data have largely been removed from products like furniture and tents after their flammability standards were updated to address modern materials and fire statistics. So it's all well, I about think we should also be looking at the necessity of the product itself. Right. Waterproof mascara is not worth ruining the ecosystem or people's health over. Yeah. And it's weird that you would put something like PFAS bound materials directly on your eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's skip the middleman here. Let's just, just apply it directly. <laughs> yeah, and jab it directly in there. Very odd, very odd. Let's, um, let me throw that link into the chat since I'm, I don't want to lag too far behind. There you go. Hello, Heavy Steel. Welcome to the show. I saw you come in earlier, um, and, um, you made those two statements, but I hope you're still here. Good to see you. I appreciate you swinging by. Uh, let's go on to the next article. So, uh, like the ebb and flow of the doom, <laughs> I guess we're going to flow over to, um, yeah, thanks. I do really do appreciate that heavy. Um, so <laughs> here is the, I don't know if this is the flow into or flow out of the doom. Check out a fairy tale English castle surrounded by a moat that you can rent on Airbnb for $6,000 a night. I love this. I want this. 
Aaliyah Shoeb I'm, is the this author. This would be great for like a large group, right? Like a large family vacation or maybe, I don't know, a wedding party or something. I mean, Not most people can't afford 6000 a night, yeah. but. <laughs> Come on. Um, my gosh, I, I wouldn't be able to recommend this for anything. This is, this is like the 0.01 percenters that would be renting this thing. But how fun would it be to have a moat? Oh man, I want a moat right now. Uh, the mayor, the mayoral mansion has one in Omtown. Um, but wow, this, this is, this would be amazing. So the articles over at businessinsider.com, by the way, the property in Norfolk, England, or it might be no, no folk or something like that. How do they pronounce it? I want the right pronunciation has 15 bedrooms and can host up to 30 people. The property is surrounded by a moat and, and acres of woodland and farmland. Look at that. Oh man. My own golf course in the backyard, that kind of thing. Not really. It actually looks kind of like outside the the perimeter. It just looks like farmland, you know, not really. Right. It doesn't look palatial or anything like that, but yeah. the moat area in the castle looks pretty cool. Yeah. Those are some manicured lawns. You can see that checkerboard patterning is, oh man, I would love that. Wouldn't like to pay the bill, but. So if you want private access to the romantic castle and acres of surrounding farmland, it could be yours for $6,000 a night. And we're actually going to look inside because business insider always has these pictures. I won't go through all of them. Um, but, uh, definitely want to tease you into going and checking it out. Heavy says you go in with a group in on this. Uh, yeah, everybody buys in and throw a LARP, a live action role playing. So, oh, that would be great in that setting. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Um, and I used to do that kind of stuff, the Society for Creative Anachronism, um, and, and uh, like Ren Fairs and stuff like that. Um, my favorite armor is Roman Lorica armor, by the way. So, uh, that was always fun. Well, anyway, this would be awesome. Castle has been a private family home since the early 1600s. That table's kind of small. <laughs> you can't even see the people at the end. <laughs> no. Yeah. Vanishing point is like a half mile away. It seems <laughs> They're just way down there. This is awesome. I love this. So like, uh, the living space has these rich earthy colors. The walls are an off white, like an eggshell. It's, it's very, I don't know. To me, it seems no matter what you do, it's going to be dark because it's a castle. Um, but it looks, it, it doesn't look like it's overstated. Like a lot of castles might be with, you know, huge painted walls and stuff like that. Um, I, I definitely dig this. Did I throw the, I didn't throw this link into the chat. So let me throw it into the chat and then y'all can go and check it out. Anybody that might be in chat and lurking. There you go. 30 guests in 15 bedrooms surrounded by a moat acres of woodland. It has a little bridge that goes across the moat. <laughs> oh my gosh. But it doesn't have I wonder a, how much you have to pay to go drive up to it and just look at it. <laughs> yeah. They might shoot you, send out some knights to cut you down. Definitely host a custom LARP here. Uh Oh, I'm going to read about you in the newspaper, aren't I heavy? Has a billiards room. Wow. Look at the vaulted ceiling. That's pretty cool. It's like a fractal kind of a thing, you know, it has a uh, geometric shapes in the ceiling, like a crystal lattice kind of thing. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Pretty neat stuff. There are um, huge fireplaces four reception rooms, social and political intrigue. It's like Daunton's Abbey. Yeah, this actually does remind me a lot of that. Although I agree with you, this is not over the top compared to what you see in some castles. Yeah, this is pretty amazing. So it says, uh, 
It has a large modern family kitchen and a separate prep kitchen. I don't see the refrigerator, but I think that there's probably enough space between the refrigerator and the kitchen island that I don't have to worry about smashing my hip into it. Every modern house has the refrigerator directly opposite the end of the kitchen island. So you open the door and you bang your butt into the back of the kitchen counter. So goofy. Come on. Maybe I just don't have a high end mayoral house. The mansion is just huge, but the one that allows me to stream, it's huge. But the house that the mayor lives in, meh. Anyway, pretty cool. Let's keep on going. We got two more articles and then y'all can go check out all of these articles. Hopefully you're checking them out while we're going through the stream. That would be cool. Talking about it as we go. This next article is over in the Greenagram category channel. Um, is CRISPR safe? Genome editing gets its first FDA scrutiny. Advisors to the U.S. regulatory agency will examine it, the safety profile of a CRISPR-based treatment for sickle cell disease. I find it interesting that CRISPR has been around for a long time and it's just now getting its first peak by the FDA. I agree. Like it, I'm actually kind of surprised by this headline. Yeah. Heidi Ledford over at nature.com put the article together. Um, the deck statement is what I just got done talking about. A therapy based on CRISPR Cas9 genome editing system could become the first of its kind to gain approval from the U S food and drug administration, but the treatment designed to alleviate a painful blood condition must first face intense scrutiny by the agency and its advisors. So it's a treatment for, it's a DNA altering therapy for sickle cell disease. Man, if this goes wrong, you're going to create either super villains or superheroes. <laughs> so that's Just interesting. Kidding. So this is being looked at for a specific application and not generally, which I mean, I know that's not that unique in medical, but um, yeah. I wonder if other stuff we've seen about CRISPR has been unrelated to sickle cell disease, for instance. Yeah, I'm really not sure. It it seems like um, it's it's been around and, and put to use for years and years. The key to this is safety, says Mark Walters. Maybe it's been used in the creation of medications, but not the treatment of um, some disease or ailment you know i'll have to look into this the the nature of prior crispr technologies it might like i said it might be used to facilitate the creation of a drug but not the drugs treatment of a of some disease so maybe that's how they get around fda so the fda looks at the drug but not at crispr itself so it says sickle cell disease is caused by abnormal forms of hemoglobin, the protein uh, in red blood cells that transports oxygen. This altered hemoglobin makes um, cells misshapen and sticky and causes them to clump together. And, and that's what sickle cell is all about. Looks like that. Um, Which and, looks like a crescent for those in the podcast. Right. Um, so Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics reported that nine months after treatment, 39 of the 40 participants in the clinical trial grew wings and flew out of the hot. Oh no, that's not what it says. Um, it says the clinical trial had not had a single vasooclusive crisis. So their blood wasn't clogging their veins. Um, before their treatment, they'd had an average of about four each year. That's pretty well, amazing. That sounds like a good statistic. Yeah. 39 out of 40 was what was up with that 40th participant? I mean, that's a 99.99 <laughs> uh, accuracy rate there. So to apply exocell clinicians uh, first collect blood producing stem cells from a person with sickle cell disease. The cells are then treated with the genome editor, which includes the Cas9 enzyme for cutting DNA and a molecule that guides the enzyme to the target stretch of DNA within the BCL11A gene. 
Once at that region, Cas9 enzyme cuts both strands of the DNA. The cell's natural DNA repair mechanism then stitch the strands back together again, but those mechanisms are prone to mistakes, which means that they often introduce errors in the DNA sequence. These errors can disable BCL11A and release the brakes on fetal hemoglobin production. So basically makes new corrected hemoglobin so that you don't um, have sickle cell and it's correct. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, I've, I'm going to have to go and look at CRISPR uh, Cas9 therapies and see. It's kind of spectacular that what amounts to a bunch of chemistry is actually making this possible. It's not mechanical in nature. It's a bunch of just chemistry thrown at it. And somehow on the other side, the DNA is corrected. So yeah, it's pretty incredible. It sounds like the main thing that they're concerned about is that this happens elsewhere. And so that could create other health issues. Such right. As, uh, cancer, et cetera. Right. Yeah. And they basically just have to monitor for that. So, and it's all invisible until you actually pull some blood and look at it and see what happens. But if 39 out of the 40 don't have an issue, and then in the long term study, they don't have any abnormal uh, other issues like cancer, because if the modification to their DNA hobbles apoptosis, then you end up with cancer. And that's the fundamental process right there. Um, if the blood, if, if the cells in your system don't die, eventually you end up with cancer. Um, so I guess that's the unwanted mutation. So we'll see. But I guess it's one way to find out if there's some other segment that CRISPR Cas9 therapy finds in the sequence, you know, it's not Absolutely. narrow enough. Absolutely. Like there could be other applications. I mean, we don't want anybody to have any unplanned mutations, of course, but that might actually lead to fundamental research in other applications, which would be beneficial in the long run. Yeah. So they're going to follow them for 15 years after their treatment. And that's really the only way to find out. You can't accelerate this um, unless they have some way of introducing this therapy into something like a, what are those flies that like their entire oh. generation is like six uh, fruit minutes? Fruit flies. Fruit flies, yeah, yeah. Drosophila. Oh, Drosophila, yeah, yeah. There's a particular fruit fly too. Um, Okay, let's keep on going. Here's the last article for today. And it's over in Stock Marketeers. Um, every day throughout October, I am trying to throw some Halloween out. And so this one slipped in at the very end. Weekend sip. This hellish whiskey comes courtesy of Southern Rock Greats, Leonard Skinnerd. I actually like the music. Charles Passy over at marketwatch.com put the article together. The band famous for such songs as Freebird and Sweet Home Alabama has gone into the booze business. Okay, wait, but which one's Leonard and which one's Skinner? <laughs> you beat me to it. We have been spending well, way too much time There together. were two people in the photo. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> which one of you is led? <laughs> Uh, I love that. That's funny. So this is Hell House Whiskey. It's 50 bucks. So it's one of those things that you can uh, buy and, and uh, almost you just buy that because of the name for Halloween and you start drinking it. I haven't heard any reviews on this. I haven't watched anybody do a review or read anything about it. I haven't even seen this article until about five minutes before the show started. Um, but it's called Hell House Whiskey. It says, uh, looking for a, a bottle to add some hellish fun to your grown-up Halloween gathering. I didn't even know it was going to be geared towards Halloween. Um, here's an offering that comes from legendary Southern rock band known for its gritty spirit. Yes, Leonard Skinner um, has gone into the booze business. 
The band, whose roots go back to the mid-1960s in Jacksonville, Florida, partnered with Bespoken Spirits, a company that's moving into creating artist-themed whiskeys. Lead singer Johnny Van Zant, who's eventually reformed the group after the 1977 plane crash that took the life of his brother, Leonard Skinnerd founder Ronnie Van Zant, had a big hand in formulating Hell House. So there you go, folks. Look at that. Everything's on fire in the background. And then they plop that whiskey glass and uh, a half bottle of Hell House American Legend uh, whiskey and Man, took a picture so quick. Themed. <laughs> this is pretty cool. I dig this. Um, it says it's a blend of whiskeys, including a rye. So take uh, it says uh, what we think about it don't let the hellish name scare you it's a very approachable whiskey easy sipper with a nice mix of sweetness and spice this spoken says you can you should pick up hints of everything from cotton candy to rose and lavender huh i might have to try it <laughs> so how to enjoy it it's a sipper so straight on the rocks if you uh, enjoy that kind of a thing so it says for a cocktail option bespoken says an old-fashioned is a way to go so i actually like a, um i love it actually old fashions well the way that i make them i make them pretty sweet though, so um i make my own uh, sugar caramel it's like a yeah, you heat up sugar. Never mind. I won't go like into it. Like a sugar it. I, solution. Yeah, but it's a little bit thicker than that. So and you, what we need to do is just go into, I need to start more shows, doggone it, but I need more time. So if you're interested in launching one of these shows with me or by yourself and you're interested in a particular show, then get in touch with me, uh, mayor at hometown.com. In the meantime, we've gone all the way through all 10 streets. So let's get back into the party bus and go all the way back to Main Street. The welcome sign, we mash that logo and yeah, we get a few uh, articles that we probably don't want to talk about, uh, but are part of life and existence. So let's see here. Minecraft YouTube series Tales from the SMP gets graphic novel adaptation. Whoa. That That's seems kind of big. That's amazing. The change agent, Captain America's new title, reveals a power he never knew he had. Interesting. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, the boys is firing back up. Or I don't know if it actually already has. Hmm. I thought it already did, but I don't know. I'll have to look. I haven't been watching I think it. it's on season four, maybe. Yeah. The Avengers just recruited the most unqualified Avenger. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Well, there's a bunch of articles. We get thousands. Um, depending on the day, in 24 hours, we parse them all. And then we select 10 of them and start talking about them um, here in Omtown Daily. But that's it. We're done for today. Thanks for coming. I am Mar <laughs> the AI is surprised that I scrolled up really fast. Um, anyway, that's it for today. Thank you very much for those in chat. Thanks for going over to YouTube and following over there. Thanks for downloading the podcast and leaving a review. If you leave a five star review, I will quote whatever it is you say in that five star review. Anything less, I might say something about it depending on what the contact context of that statement is um and don't forget there's a patreon but they're really we don't really do much over there but and there's a discord um where else i don't know everywhere be sure to hang out on the website most people use the website for the news aggregation portion of it and once you become a citizen you can swipe left and right and save articles or uh, hide them forever Although there's a list that you'll be able to see right here. Um, that's it. We'll see you tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, on Saturday and Sunday, the show starts at 6 p.m. Eastern. But Monday through Friday, 8 p.m. See you tomorrow.
I'm Mayor Watt. That's hometown.com. And up there is the sentient AI that's going to say, Ciao, baby. Maybe not. Ciao, baby. <laughs> wow. Good night, hometown citizens. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> See you tomorrow. Take care, Heavy. Thanks for hanging out. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao, baby.